Welcome again to another episode of Advocacy Arena. I am here today with a very old and dear friend of mine, and we're going to be having a conversation uh, about uh, the place where he grew up. Um, This is Chris that I have here with me, and um, we'll be delving into some German um, history. And uh, you guys know that I love to talk about that a lot. So welcome, Chris. Uh, Glad to have you here. Glad we have been able to finally nail down this interview conversation (laughs) that we've been planning for a while. So if you would um, just say hello and tell folks um, where you were born and where you grew up. Yeah, let me take over the Indija. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yes. So I, I'm a Luxembourgish citizen. So for Americans, it's not so easy to know where Luxembourg is, but it's a little country Europe. Uh, it's uh, neighbored by Belgium, France, and Germany. And I was born in the late 50s. And uh, I was born of uh, an, a mother who was a German, father who was Luxembourg. And the uh, German mother obviously comes from German family, I was living in the Weimar Republic, Third Reich. Mm-hmm. And uh, my Luxembourgish side of the family was rather anti German. And uh, that must have been they, interesting. They had, yeah, they had, they, they were resistance uh, fighters in Luxembourg. Mm-hmm. So uh, <clears throat> one needs to know that the Luxembourg as a country was was occupied from uh, 10th of May 1940 until 10th of September 1944 by German. Uh, there was German rule in Luxembourg. There was no French spoke change his name, German song. Oh, when was this? Yeah, well, that was uh, from 10th of May 1940 till 10th of September 1944, when actually the Americans uh, liberated. Uh, wow. Okay, so the uh, Luxembourgish part of the family was always uh, very suspicious in Germany. Then when my parents uh, met in the late 50s, it was a little bit of a sense of political situation. Mm-hmm. So what what I what I remember, you know, growing up was uh, obviously visited family in Germany and uh, mainly in the uh, city of Aachen. Aachen was one of the cities which was bombarded heavily in mm. uh, 43. And uh, I, I still remember that you could see a war damage in early 60s. German. Wow. And, uh, you know, my, my grandmother on mother's side, so it's German, my German, she, she was actually the one who talked to me most about how she had experienced the war. So she lost one son, a uh, German Wehrmacht East Front. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I was in the Ukraine, in Jetomir, German Wehrmacht. Okay. Got as, as, as far as uh, Jetomir in the Ukraine at the time, and then they were pushed back. So that's where he died. And then another son, he was a uh, prisoner of war until the uh, late 40s. So he worked in aluminium factory. War slave. Mm-hmm. He worked in Magnitogorsk aluminium factory, so he was only liberated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then she, you know, I was already interested at the time to understand. So, were you Nazis? Were you a member of the NSDA now workers? Mm-hmm. So, and the answer was, oh, no, no, no. We were grand that he was part of uh, the Centrum Partei, which was a conservative part, middle middle of the spectrum. Uh, but even though I, I was never sure, I would say that he, mm-hmm. he was uh, he was an, uh, he was working with the tax authorities, you know, finance guy. Mm-hmm. With Tax, tax authorities. And he, he never lost his job. And I, I remember I asked my granddad, said, granddad, opa. Right. Granddad, yeah, granddad, yeah opa. Oma, Oma and Oma Opa. And opa. So I said, but, but Opa, you know, I have read, I said to her that if you were not part of the NSDAP, you couldn't even have a job. Yeah, he was... Uh, he was very important, so yeah, okay. So <laughs> I had to uh, to believe that at the time. Uh, but you know what 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 uh, what she also told me was uh, they they never realized what happened. She said, yeah, but they didn't know many. But she always avoided. Then a little bit later, I realized if you work in uh, with the tax authorities, if you're a tax man, so yes. Mm-hmm. In, I think it was in 1936 or 7, where 20% of the budget of the German Reich was actually from confiscations from Jews, you mm-hmm. know, where they just took, took values, took everything away from Jews, which they incarcerated mm-hmm. So the, the, the stealing from the Jews was a major part of the German budget. And I always said, and if you work in the uh, tax department, tax authorities, you cannot overlook that right. Jewish assets have been stolen. Certain. So there were already was, uh, and and like, how old were you when this well, kind of this understanding 
Um, yeah, maybe the, between 10, 10 and 16, yes. Yes, you started yes. to have a little bit of a different understanding from the story yeah. you were being told. Mm -hmm. You need to know also that, uh, you know, as part of history, the uh, student movement uh, in 1968, I think it started in Berkeley, actually, and then France, Germany, around the world, there were, mm -hmm. particularly in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, movement was uh, fueled by a rebellion of uh, young people at the time, realized how much their parents actually have. Mm. But that was the first, that was a generation born shortly after the war, who has, have not experienced the war and who started to realize how much criminal, how, how much unjust act their parents had. Right. So that, that's the youth uh, then rebelled against their parents, they rebelled against institutions, they rebelled against their professors. Because the reality was, uh, after war, there, there, there were about 100,000 war criminals just who were never, never brought to just, never held a mass. Mm -hmm. And then there were other millions who were just running with it and uh, also no accountability. So many of these Nazis rated late in the Justice Department, in education, professors at universities and Nazis, you know, and, and, and at one stage the youth realized, that, talking about after the war, you know, how uh, former Nazis uh, were integrated against in Germany. But it was mm -hmm. also done with the help of uh, the US uh, occupying forces uh, for, for countries who occupied Germany, Russia, America. The Americans were very generous in rating former Nazis into uh, institutions because they actually needed people who uh, who knew how to run an institution or a bureaucracy. So it was... Uh... <laughs> it, it, it was not because of generosity, it was because uh, for uh, having capable people um, integrate. Uh, mm -hmm. So so many Nazis found themselves uh, back in the sea. Even the widows, you know, got uh, generous uh, pensions from uh, the uh, post-German Christian, Christian Soviet government. No, and, and with all of that, you could see that in the 1960s and 70s, there was no talk anymore about uh, Nazi Germany. People, uh, people followed their business, uh, economy was growing, uh, people became richer everybody could uh, afford a car now and i remember in my family who was a, a very conservative uh, christian but roman castle christian in the saint jelly west roman castle mm -hmm. and there were priests and i remember we once had a conversation uh, around the Jews in uh, in the Third Reich. And it, it was so shocking to me that I still remember, you know, my, my uncle, uh, his name was Ferdinand. <laughs> my, uncle, my uncle, he said, yes, you know, the, the problem with the Jews was that we considered them, they, they, they were responsible for killing, they, they were the assassins of Jesus. And uh, so, you know, that, that for him was good enough a reason to rationalize what happened to him. Wow. Can, can you imagine, you know, like mm -hmm. 35 generations later, help people responsible. But, you know, it's just, it, it's one of the uh, criteria for fascist state is that you are not acting as government for everybody. Is that big? Mm -hmm. In your country, Mr. Biden, right. he is someone who acts for every American, mm -hmm. while the other side excludes many people you know and then make some uh, make some uh, enemies and make them the focus of their hate fascists can work with hate somewhere right and it's so, interesting that uh, you talked about uh, you, the roman catholic aspects of, of this because um, I have been having a lot of conversations with folks in my community with what I feel like is a current, um, perhaps the major threat that we are facing here in the United States. Of course, fascism, mm -hmm. but a real uh, particular uh, brand that is uh, heavily doused uh, in religion. It's like this uh, yeah. white Christian nationalism and it's not new, you know, so. Yes. Well, especially the Protestants, the evangelical side of, of uh, Christianity, Germany was very pro Pro Nazi, and then in other in other fascist countries in Europe, like Spain, you know, the Church, Roman Catholic Church, very very close. Mm -hmm. So you know, but then, uh, but maybe we come to that a bit later now to the uh, correlations mm -hmm. to today. But uh, you know, in the conversations with my grandmother, what I still remember is she talked a lot about the hardship. They were enduring. They as German, and uh, she, mm. she, she really had it against the British who bombed their nice town. town. Mm -hmm. 
talking about uh, how how she complained about uh, you know the Germans were tree bombed out. They had to endure famine uh, between forty five and forty seven. And and there was always no. We didn't know what happening. We didn't we didn't see it. We didn't hear it. We had our. But on the other side, there were many of my uncles. Uh, so uh, the uh, brothers of my grandmother who actually were in the Wehrmacht, who were soldiers in the Wehrmacht. Her own sons, one was dead, a POV in Soviet Union, and then from other aunts, one also killed them. But and, and then you know these uh, these Wehrmacht soldiers from the family actually they uh, they had uh, letters they have been sent and uh, these letters uh, have been found and uh, those one one that puts them into a little book mm -hmm. and then in the letters you see uh, you know what these Wehrmacht soldiers exposed to but. Again, it was very much sent. Could never see where they were. You know, whether they were in Belgium, in Ukraine, in Lithuania, <laughs> and the uh, dates were also not given. Couldn't talk casually. But uh, some some things were still interesting to read about. But you know, I, I felt like they they uh, they sensed that they were more victims than doers. Mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah, and uh, you know how how has all of that impacted my understanding of my family for myself? You know, for about forty years, uh, Germans became a bit cool uh, on their Nazi. Uh, felt like had then also a lot of old Nazis died. Circle of life takes care of this. But, uh, you know, there, there were still uh, countries in Europe who endured the fascist, the authoritarian, both in Spain and Greece uh, up to the mid-70s. Okay, but uh, so I, I was never, I was always suspicious. Uh, but in the relationship with uh, my uh, Luxembourg side of the family, where uh, my grandmother grandmother lost uh, one of her brothers. He was actually um, uh, through treason, through treason from a neighbor. He was delivered to Gestapo, mm. and then uh, he was uh, he was executed on August tenth, ninety four. Oh my uh, goodness. Cold. Köln Klingelputz prison and and he he was just uh, two years old. Oh wow! Uh, and uh, and uh, the uh, the judge who actually uh, um, uh, who gave him the death penalty he became a very famous judge afterwards at the uh, Koblenz Koblenz uh, in in Luxembourg he was uh, got the death penalty award this mm. judge yes but. Mm. But the Luxembourgers did not execute German who got the death penalty. They, they said, uh, the, uh, the prime minister at the time, he said, let's let's send this piece of shit over the M Moselle River back to the Germans. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Luxembourgers only uh, executed war criminals who the time. Okay. But the Germans, uh, Germans, even though they had death penalties, they got away. But then afterwards, he, he just covered up death penalty. So he made a big career. All right. So, uh, but then also then on the Luxembourg, that singer was, uh, was left to fall asleep. One didn't talk is the time just heals also so and um <clears throat> do you want to take over with one of the questions yes um, um i just you you've shared a lot and i appreciate you because i kind of gave you some questions to think about so that we could you know really suss out some of your history and your understanding of your family's um, history interwoven into your countries uh, both countries histories and you've done a fantastic job um you know sharing that i i just would kind of like to know, and I don't know that you have an answer for this, um, how how that sits with you and how you kind of navigate that that legacy in your daily life, you know? Well, not, you know, there's not much I can do. All are dead now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, all, they're really all dead. I mean, the whole generation for me, they're all gone on, on the side of uh, Luxembourgish family. Also the German. No one I ask. But what I'm doing since probably 20 years is that uh, I'm always... Uh, when there is a succession, you know, if one of these people died and there wasn't, there was stuff to uh, distribute it or succession, so I did come, come over and take what you want to mm -hmm. know from uncle, uncle uh, here and there. And I, I always try to find paper, documents, stuff like that. I, I have yeah. a nice collection of things, but I, I still haven't really plowed through. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a historian. Uh, yeah. Use a little bit more of the documents. It would be interesting. Um, yeah. I'm a bit yeah, of a history bug, um, and that takes time. But I think it's it's time um, well spent. And you know that brings me to another question I have for you. Like um, like you and I have been friends for a long time, and I know that uh, you love to read and you have a great understanding of history, not only your own but you know of other countries as well and and you spent many years here in 
America. And so in Tennessee, exactly, which is how we met some 20 odd years ago. I can't even believe that that much time has passed. It seemed like yesterday. <laughs> but um, what kind of similarities um, of that era, um, you know, what you know of it and what you've learned of it, do you see and recognize um, today in our political systems, you know, here in America and there in, in Europe as well, because I feel like there is a rising um, authoritarianism, this this kind of uh, nostalgic uh, lurch back toward uh, this kind of Nazi uh, past, this um, Christian nationalism kind of um, ideology. What are your thoughts? Yes, I mean, uh, first of all, there uh, should be a clear definition of fascism for everyone, uh, which is uh, understood. I mean, uh, the, uh, the stable genius uh, on your side, you know, he uses the word fascism when he talks about his opponents, but... <laughs> We all know he does a psychological mirror. Yes, he, <laughs> we call it he projection. Does, you know, he accuses yes. others, he's actually in it. So, <laughs> first of all, there should be a clear definition of fascism, and that is that, you know, a fascist government always have people outside find as their enemies, and then part of the population, very, very easy to influence uh, with propaganda, you know, and then you get you get an outside enemy, and then the simple minds can focus their hate on, you know, that's, that's what's mm -hmm. so. It's clear which part is in that definition part is not in that ocean so, right and uh, you know um what one uh, in, in germany there's a saying which says wird in anfängen wird in anfängen means uh, mind's beginnings you know mind mind the early steps mm -hmm. and uh People don't realize how, how quickly, actually, authoritarian regimes are able. Mm. Uh, the people don't realize how a propaganda machine gets organized and how that starts working. It starts with uh, getting the media under your control. You can see that in, in uh, semi- or quasi-authoritarian states, even as part of the European Union, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. Poland. Exactly. The government that in Poland uh, aligns the media, then Hungary is a very good example where... Oh, Oh, yes, Victor Orban. Yes, he, yes. he and then is. In Italy, you know, now in Italy with uh, Mrs. Meloni, uh, neo fascist, yes. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, that's the definition of her party. <laughs> it's it, exactly. Called, Isn't she a, a, a direct descendant yeah. of Mussolini, a well, granddaughter or yes, something? She's, she, no, not, not that direct, but family. Okay. Um, you know, she is uh, her party, you know, Fratelli d'Italia. They are working very hard to get the, uh, the RAI, so the uh, Italian uh, state television show that that's mm -hmm. not very visible outside. And actually today, they started to change the constitution, you know, that wow. the, 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 the way they want to elect presidents in future will be changed. And then obviously Russia is another authoritarian state where you see how it is, uh, is, 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 is getting uh, 70 or 80 percent of the population. Mm -hmm. Imper imperialistic war everywhere, tech neighbor. So, it, it can go very fast that it gets into authoritarian and uh, but and then once the thing is done it's very difficult to get out right the, the germans the germans had a uh, uh, quickly uh, what they call the uh, ermächtigungsgesetze which were laws which would give a total uh, total authority to to the leaders you didn't have right. to go through parliament that's just mm. the leader who uh, can oh decide. interesting you say that because um the conservatives here have um their agenda ready to go as well it's called Project 2025. <laughs> nice. uh, and I love what you said, uh, the German saying, uh, if you would say it again, because there is a historian who speaks to this, who's, who studies uh, fascist regimes and authoritarian re regimes, who has come up with some rules. And, and this German saying sounds very much like his first rule. And you may be familiar with him because I know you're well read and that's timothy snyder um he says do not obey in advance uh from his um little um book of instruction on how to avoid authoritarian on tyranny um so what's the german saying again uh, mind 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 the early steps or mind the beginnings yes. mm -hmm. yeah so watch watch the beginning right and uh, 
You know, the, the, what, what Germany obviously was in the situation uh, helped ascend authoritarian was that the Weimar Republic, especially under the last chancellor, whose name was Brüning, Brüning had no vision for this country. German. Brüning was just a, a very tough guy on budgets, uh, just staff. And, and before Brüning was the chancellor of the Weimar Republic, obviously there was not. Here comes America into play again, because there were a lot of U.S. credits given to the Weimar Republic. And in 1929, when, uh, when uh, the uh, big financial crisis, crisis hit happy mm -hmm. uh, the uh, American US Bank pulled all the credit, credit. and uh, you know so German thrown horrible uh, deficit mm -hmm. uh, the Chancellor had very tough a safe road economy. austerity and measures <laughs> austerity uh, so the economical climate was very difficult and uh, you know, when Hitler uh, presented himself as a candidate, he was actually a uh, darling by industrialists. Mm -hmm. All all the big industrialists, they were all, all pro-Hitler. Mm -hmm. uh, Hitler also helped them with their profitability by, by, by giving them, them uh, slave workers. Yes, so they, they had the cheap or zero-cost labor. He also organized them. So the industrialists really, really... Right. Nice. And, and then, obviously, uh, yes, with all... You know, you had it in the US, too, with the New Deal, where huge infrastructure... Mm -hmm. Done. So Hitler just did so. He also had it. Uh, so uh, unemployment got through again. Things seem pretty rosy in the beginning, huh? <laughs> I was going to say that the Weimar Republic 1932-33 was in economically in really, really bad shape. And that then helped the ascendance of the extreme. And uh, if you look at what the public address does, they try to talk Americans into a bad economy. They, they, mm -hmm. they say the economy hasn't been as bad, never been as bad as under the Joe, under Joe. You know, mm -hmm. they talk everything down, even though, you know, if, if you are not totally debile, you must see. <laughs> that the opposite is happening or or you have to say, okay just go with the narrative of the republicans that it's it's really that better but uh, mm -hmm. i i don't know as a those who uh, vote for the republican party in the u.s whether they actually know that this party not at all acting in their interest what you what you have again is this uh, republican party is is very much over here is that people like uh, this guy schwartzman you know from blackrock the uh, richest investment funds earth you know that he's uh, decidedly pro Trump you know so this this really uh, really makes makes me nervous uh, and then when you see that many CEOs in the US just like the industrialists in Germany, you know they become cycles of the system mm. yeah, that, that, that that I find that really really worrying you know that it, yes. it's just the only interest is a financial interest. It's not the interest uh, of society. It's the interest of, of a country. Right. And uh, all right. So uh, it is a lot of um, things uh, over here from Europe, which uh, I see a little bit of, of a parallel parallelism mm -hmm. happening. Well, may maybe we can do a part two. Um, I'm um, not sure how long our connection um, is going to be, but just um, share some of your closing thoughts um, around what we're dealing with, you know, like here in America and mm. and and abroad and and maybe from a um, historical standpoint, how we might be able to better deal with it because of the history that we know. Well, it gets more and more difficult, you know, with uh, social media and with manipulation and uh, the Supreme Court thinking that free speech is uh, fifteen thousand lies uh, for years, you know. <laughs> free speech and it should should stay you know that that's very very dangerous young people on tiktok you know they they use that as, as something to inspire so know what to vote for for example in germany the right-wing part is, is is very very good running uh, their tiktok mm, so they yes. picked yes. up and, uh, uh, some you, of goebel's skills huh yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah so uh, and they they are they are much superior they have young young cause them fascists you know young mm. they, they are like like a Bannon, but younger. Mm -hmm. Or a guy like this Miller. Miller reminds me of Goebbels. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, so uh, they, they have smart people uh, who uh, try to take over uh, the brains of the young people through social. I think that is really, really dangerous. Who can, at the end of the day, differentiate of what is true and what is not? And if you look at the name, name the uh, stable genius gave to his... Uh, <laughs> yes, media. it's a true, true social. Yes, true. <laughs> right. It's right. Nothing, nothing about you know, a president lies few thousand times uh, during and during a govern governing for four years. You know what is truth? So 
There's such a way to manipulate population propaganda, very negative about it. You see that there is uh, Axis, uh, Axis, Iran, North Korea, Russia. Then you have these uh, countries who don't want to uh, alienate Russia, like South Africa, Brazil, India. They, they all seem to be and then China, they, they mm. all challenge the democratic system. They all have, they are all afraid of democracy. You know why? Because democracy uh, can be a virus, which when it spreads into their countries, it creates unstable. And the oligarchs in those countries, uh, we lose control. Right. So that, that's why the propaganda is out there now to actually mess, mess around all these democracies. Right. Axis, evil, I can see, calls them axis for us, for democracy. Exactly. They mess around and they, they try to suffocate the democratic movement so they don't spread in their own. Exactly. So Exactly. Over again. Yeah. Democracy bad, authoritarian. Uh, Nism good um, is basically right. the word um, that they're trying to push. And, and therein um, lies the issue, a fight that I feel like we're going to continue to have for quite some time. And I would like for us to have another conversation because I think it's important to kind of um, a lot of people, of course, in our country have not traveled abroad. Some of them haven't been out of their own towns. But to understand that this is not just a, a national issue that we're facing, but a global issue. And, you know, how uh, because of global uh, economies that exist now, our democracies are also intertwined. And um, so I think it is really important that we have an understanding not only of what is going on in our country, but kind of around the world and to see this threat that's rising around the world and how um, it rises. And I really appreciate you sharing with us today, you know, some of the history that took place in um, your country and, and the neighboring country of, you know, which is, is part of your heritage as well. Um, so any last words uh, before we perhaps um, get... Well, <laughs> I think it was a little bit of a difficult conversation. So uh, you can edit it. Uh, not to worry. I, I'll get no, it but, done. <laughs> no, but in terms of uh, the topic, as uh, <clears throat> I've all been said, uh, I'm, I'm 65 very soon. So uh, I'm not an actor anymore. I'm, I'm not a not working industry anymore. I spend uh, most of my life working for a big U.S. corporation. So I know how a U.S. businessman thinks. And I'm, I'm actually amazed you know how CEOs in public come in the US they they would they would trade you know uh, less regulation slashing regulations slashing trust uh, laws slashing price uh, fixed price limits on drugs and on medical services slashing taxes you know like mm. this is the thing which needs to happen for them to be happy but mm. this is not in the interest of the people you know antitrust mm. is not Regulation is not. I mean, people will be killed if environmental regulations are, are lifted. Yes, so the benefit of having affordable medical coverage, you know, is mm -hmm. gone. You know, if if CEOs of medical companies uh, want the Republicans to slash these uh, price caps, they're not talking about tax. So right. I'm, I'm I'm just amazed that no one on that side seems to consider collateral damage done to society. So is the US really a country grift us? Grift <laughs> It yeah. seems and I that asked way. To my colleagues, to my colleagues, my, most of them, I met some of them recently. They, they think, uh, you know, a, a, a party which guarantees them low taxes is what they want. Mm -hmm. So let's not worry about any collective. <laughs> low taxes, less regular, and no end trust or zing trust. Mm -hmm. Not at all in the American land, not at all in the world. It's just in one of the center mm -hmm. of <laughs> Yes, well. Uh... That would be my closing, my closing word from Nazi German to <laughs> <laughs> what is in preparation okay well thank you again so much for taking the time to uh chat with me share some of your your thoughts and um ideas around what's going on currently in our countries um uh, respectively so um again i i've enjoyed it i think other people will enjoy um learning and hearing from um a different perspective, uh, yet understand the striking similarities. So perhaps um, we will have another opportunity to do this and we won't have so many interruptions, but it's okay because I have a great editing tool. So we'll Good. piece it all together and no one will ever know. <laughs> okay. So I okay. want to say, um, don't get shine and I'll be the same. <laughs> 
Okay, gute Nacht, auf Wiedersehen. Bis bald. Ach, tschüss. Ach, tschüss. tschüss. Bye.